Hello, and thank you for coming uh, for this uh, great event. Thank you for the organizer. Thank you for having me. Uh, my conversation today is about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, AI, is something that I believe all of you are, hurry, are, are hearing in every conference that you go to, every security conference, and everybody is talking about AI. And in order to show you that everybody talk about AI, I brought some quotes from some friends of us uh, that couldn't be here tonight, uh, unfortunately, or today. Uh, the first one is uh, Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, the great Stephen Hawking, that says that the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. A little pessimistic, but a very insightful thought. The second guy is this guy. Do you know this guy? The guy with the apples, the, yeah, <laughs> vegetables, something. <laughs> uh, so, so he said, uh, Steve Wozniak, of course, that computers are going to take over from humans. There's no question about it. Another great saying is from another friend of us, this guy, that says, Elon Musk, of course, that said that AI will be the most likely cause of WW3, World War III. A little, again, a little apocalyptic, but that's it. The fourth one is a good friend of us. He wanted to be here. He couldn't be here because something with his neighbors. I don't know. He couldn't be. So, oh, you know him. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, Vladimir Putin says a country that leads in AI development will be the ruler of the world. So, Everybody really is talking about uh, artificial intelligence across all the industry, across all technologies, and, but they're not just talking about artificial intelligence. You will see that many people not, not just talk, but also put money on it. If you look at the map of startups all across the industry of technology, not just in cybersecurity, everybody is investing billions and billions of dollars in companies that invest in artificial intelligence. So I think that AI is very much probably known as the next industrial revolution. Let's look at the previous industrial revolution a few, hundred, a few years ago. Uh, the, industrial, uh, uh, the first industrial revolution in the beginning of the century uh, in the, uh, was aimed in order to replace muscles Yes, yes, by, by machines. Okay, w and why is it uh, uh, done like that? Because in the factories in the beginning uh, of the decade, and, and in, sorry, in the beginning of the century, uh, uh, all the people that worked in factories had to take a break and had to think and, uh, you know, uh, had a, a cigarette break and uh, complained about the, the work uh, that they uh, had to do. And they got tired and they wanted a vacation. And the machines that came to replace these efforts really didn't have all that. They could do many, many different things without all the limitations that human being had. And this is exactly where the next AI revolution is going through. It uh, comes to, uh, the machines comes to replace not the muscles, but what the brain is really capable of doing. And by mechanizing that, and by replacing it with machines or machine learning, the abilities are really, really inevitable. So we can see that machine learning and artificial intelligence already takes place in our daily lives today already. When you go to any shopping uh, website, like you see here in uh, Amazon, you see that you are given recommendation without really requesting it. How does the website, no. So here, this is my recommendation. And you can see a very interesting, if you look at the <laughs> items here, you can see the, you know, the process that you go through from a musician, rock musician, towards a very <laughs> a traditional change towards being a father of six children with small babies and a wife. So you can see that the machine that uh, 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 recognized my patterns of shopping has already recognized the change that I've gone through in life. So this is one way where artificial intelligence takes place in our lives. Another way is this one. 
Uh, you know that today, if you have, uh, if you're taking photographies like I do, for example, I'm an amateur photographer, you would see that the computer knows by itself to tag, without you tagging the photograph, without you writing, this is a cake or this is a musical instrument, it knows to tag exactly what are you looking for. In this place, I've looked for guitar and the computer knew in Google, knew exactly where did I take pictures of guitars in my entire collections and it didn't have the difference between musicians during a concert and my son somewhere there dressed as a rock uh, guitarist uh, with a guitar toy and other s statues of guitars that have taken place. By the way, if you're using Apple, uh, uh, and this is not in any way a commercial, but if you're using the brand new iOS 12 in Apple, it knows also you just press, you just search in your iPhone or in your iPad for something within this library and you will look without picking it in front. So how does it know? This is what machines or artificial intelligence have the ability to do. Also, today in our lives, we have speech recognition. Uh, we have uh, Siri and Alexa and all sorts of good friends around the technologies that have the ability to uh, help us in all sorts of... Are you using one of these? Yeah. So this is also based on artificial intelligence. So the question that really everybody is asking is really why now? What has changed now? Why everybody today are dealing or well, want to deal with artificial intelligence. So, uh, like many, many things in life, this is divided to three parts. The first of all, storage. We have the ability to store peta and petabytes of data across any organizations that we take place. And in order to store amount of information, this is exactly what you need in order to feed a very good AI machine. Also, the computation uh, power or abilities have really progressed along the years with better processors and uh, better computers that have the ability to really digest, not just store, but digest and analyze this entire data that has been growing exponentially across any kind of industry uh, that takes uh, 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 and uses a lot of data. Third, last but not least, is of course mathematics. We can see from all the academic uh, institutions that the uh, power and the abilities and the mathematicians are really putting a lot of focus and a lot of efforts in mathematical algorithms, new mathematical algorithms that have the ability to do this artificial intelligence. And we call it in different names, deep learning, machine learning, uh, analytics, every way in that sort. So the question that everybody asks, and the question that you hear specifically now, I'm taking you also or shifting you towards uh, our world, which is the cybersecurity world, really is artificial intelligence magic? Is it like a black box that we put whatever data we want in it and we get the results that are desired and nobody really knows, only if you're a PhD in mathematics, really knows what you're doing. Is it really magic? So, in order to answer this, I wanted to give you some live examples from the world of technologies that happened in recent years. You know this girl? Tybot. Tybot is um, sort of uh, an experiment that a company, a small company, goes by the name of Microsoft, right, has uh, tried uh, to and uh, introduced to the market a few years ago. Tybot is... Um, mechanism or uh, uh, in a website, yeah, that you can chat with uh, along and she answers you online. So this is what Microsoft has went, uh, went, uh, went live a few years ago. And you know in artificial intelligence, in deep learning, in everything of that sort, the more data you feed the machine, the more it learns and this is how it reacts. So Microsoft launched this girl or this machine called Tybot and after only three and a half to four hours this is what the result was online. Why? 
why this is what Microsoft saw online. Because the online world has a lot of different people, colorful people, that are communicating. Uh, yes, exactly. I wa I, you, you notice that I do not read what's there because it's, uh, I will, this is a very, you know, a very <laughs> prestigious forum. But this is what happened. Of course, Microsoft shut down this. This is what Tybot responded to all the people that communicated with her. Why? Because this is the data or this is the information she was fed into. Another good example is this. Anybody speaks the language of Turkish, the Turkish language? No. Okay, one. Okay, <laughs> so this is uh, an experiment in Turkey where uh, students t wrote a few Turkish uh, sentences or terms and Google Translate tried to translate what's there. I don't know if you know in the Turkish, the girl can explain to us, yes, the tur in Turkish, right, in the language there's no e or she. Okay, it's just it. Okay, this is how Google translated this sentence. Pay attention. She is a cook. He is an engineer. He is a doctor. She is a nurse. If you go down a little bit, she is embracing her. He does not embrace her. She is married. He is single. And one of the favorites, he is happy. She is not happy. I don't know. This is Google Translate. Now, what is the, what is the reason for that? Did Google Translate engineers were biased, sexually biased? Of course not. But again, this is uh, one of the biggest principles in AI uh, in that we will go through. And it will show you that AI is not magic. It's not really mambo jumbo that you put. There are reasons why all this has happened. But you will find that despite that this is not magic, it is very, very useful. And it is useful specifically when you use AI with uh, solutions that requires, first of all, data. A lot of data with rich data. This is exactly the point where small startups, as great as they will be, and large companies that has visibility to enormous amount of data, this is where they part. A good AI system, a good AI mechanism, engines, whatever it is, requires enormous amount of samples, enormous amounts of data in order to provide you a clearer, better, more focused, more accurate results. Accuracy is something, I don't need to tell you this, but accuracy is something that within the, the security world, of course, is very, very crucial. This is the first part. The second part is expertise. And again, this is really the difference where small niche startups and big companies are different. You need domain expertise in order to enrich this artificial intelligence domain or sorry, engine or whatever it is in order to make it really better, stronger and accurate. You can't have it. This is why when you uh, uh, analyze, uh, for example, uh, digital photography within a hard case, you know you need to have someone that understands digital photography. Or you analyze translation, like, just like we saw. You need someone that understands what he's talking about. So this is where we go or drill down a little bit to AI and cybersecurity. And the question again, is really AI in cybersecurity magic? I've been to numerous big conferences of cybersecurity, not just checkpoint events, of course, all the RSAs and Black Hats, and you can see many different companies that says, yeah, we don't need rules, we don't need a big system, all you do is give us some data, we put it into our AI machine, and we will give you the most accurate results ever. Really? Black box? You don't know anything about it. You just put data and it from one place and it gives you the accurate information from second place. I don't know. I would go and check if this is as accurate as possible. 
The key problems that you see in these examples is again the issue of data, not having enough data or uh, not having enough expertise. The combination of not having enough data and not having enough expertise, first of all, uh, is, is really limitation of small companies and big companies. Small companies have issues, naturally, with access to cybersecurity training data, which they, are which they can provide you with only limited amount of this data, and this will always limit the results that you will receive from this quote, not quote, black box. Second of all, verdict. In artificial intelligence, which is based on mathematics, the verdict turns to be obscure. It's like, for example, if you do anomaly detection, let's say, with artificial intelligence, the results or the verdict is usually, this is an anomaly. Why? Because the mathematics decided that this is an anomaly. Why is it decided like this? Go ahead and check. This is not accurate. And this is a little bit obscure and can make the, the life of the IT or the security investigator or whoever uses this a little bit complicated. Also, the uh, amounts of false positives, AI machines, whatever it is, if it's a detection engine or whatever it is, tends to have low false positives, uh, sorry, a high false positives. This could be critical for any IT department, for any security organizations that are using this, because we all know that high percentage of false positives uh, can make the security mechanism really problematic and really not useful, very not accurate. So, sorry, again, one, one more point. Uh, as I said, the high point and, and the, 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 uh, the verdict issue, if you are, have, need a verdict, when you're looking at my photos of uh, guitars and suddenly you have a detection of a guitar that is a toy and not a guitar that is a real guitar, no harm there. But in the security world, when the verdict is problematic, it can be much more challenging. So, again, even in cybersecurity, AI is really not magic, but it is useful. It is useful and even, I can say this in confidence, that artificial intelligence is revolutionizing the, the cybersecurity world. It's, revolutioni it's revolutionizing it because it has abilities that regular humans are limited at. And they allow you to really mechanize processes that requires a lot of data and are essential in order to detect malware in order to detect security events that require attention, immediate attention. And I want to give you some examples of what we in Checkpoint are doing in artificial intelligence. The first example is something that we call campaign hunting. Campaign hunting or is really the ability to provide a predictive threat intelligence. As you know, th uh, Checkpoint is installed all over the world and we're using the largest cybersecurity, or the, we're leverage, leveraging the largest cybersecurity community in the world. Next to me, we have Maya Horowitz, uh, who is the head of the, uh, the group that deals with the intelligence in, in uh, Checkpoint. Uh, and in order to leverage an enormous amount of threat intelligence and expose unknown uh, uh, events uh, we're doing, um, usually, we're taking, let's say, a URL. Well, I'll give you a small example. If you're taking a bad reputation URL and you have an analyst that detected it and has the ability to understand what it contains and where it got from, and then later on duplicate it and understand if similar URLs are coming, you need to put it in your threat intelligence uh, engine and understand uh, how is this uh, really contributing to the de your detection and later on to your prevention? So what we really did is mechanized this process and we taught a machine to understand this and really has the ability to attribute attacks to big campaigns, not just dedicated specific events and enrich the threat intelligence for predictive campaign prevention. Remember these words. The results 
decrease, an increase of 10% in the feed info inside threat intelligence that is based on specific AI. So 10% more of detections that are coming specifically from that feed. This is a very, very powerful enhancement to this feed of threat intelligence. Second of all, a uh, second example, sorry, is what we call Huntress. Huntress deals with malicious executables. Malicious executables are always pro problematic, unlike, let's say, regular files like Word files or something like this that you know how to analyze. Executables can practically do everything. And this is why the verdict or understanding whether they are malicious or not are much difficult. And this is another place where we've leveraged our sandboxing uh, technology in order to dynamically analyze the executables within this uh, uh, area by using artificial intelligence and apply machine learning to reach malicious uh, 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 verdict. And this is something very, very crucial to when you're dealing with this kind of files, executable files. Where this is a something that is, which is very, very unique and very, very f uh, uh, powerful to the technology that we use. But we're not just detecting it, we're not just recognizing it. Later on, of course, we have the feedback loop for continuing learning. This is part of the machine learning process that the machines know how to do. The results, an increase of 13% in unique detection solely by this engine. Again, accuracy, uniqueness of detection is something very, very crucial to this entire process of what artificial intelligence is doing within security. Last but not least, something we call cadet. All these technologies, by the way, are what we call under the hood. And also, uh, most of them are already active within the detection engines that all of you are using. Cadet, context-aware detection. This is where we really harness the checkpoint advantage of having so much data, having so much sensors around the world that we use in our analysis. Now imagine the difference between analyzing a specific event of a malicious file or a malicious event, unlike uh, doing and looking at the full context of it. For example, a file that got to me via email is one thing of detecting it, but another thing is understanding where did the email came from, who, uh, uh, who uh, like me, within the organization receive this kind of file, what hours, uh, uh, who else was this sent to, from where was it sent to, specific IPs, all the context or looking at the big picture is something that machines are able to do mathematically and are being done with this engine. So this is really looking at the full context and of an inspected uh, 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 element and extracting the parameters from the environment, taking from a thousands of parameters of each event to one indicator or one accurate verdict. So if you, you know, took notes or, or understood or, or sh listened to, to, to the repeating terms that here, I think that are um, meaningful within this entire uh, explanation of what AI is contributing, it contributes to accuracy, it o a, a, a contributes to confidence in each and every of the detection, and as a result, it really contributes to the efficiency of security. By the way, the results from CADET has shown that misdetections are down twofold, and the false positive are down tenfold. These are very impressive numbers. Again, that takes you to the issue of accuracy and confidence in every detection. And this is, again, goes back to the entire, uh, I saw in the first presentation, the ethos of uh, what Checkpoint is doing in terms of prevention, but not just prevention, practical prevention. Because we believe 
that accuracy and confidence really contributes to what it is the security world is needing. And this is practical, efficient prevention. Once again showing that when it comes to prevention, we hope at least, the checkpoint is the vendor to consider. For us, prevention is not just theory or philosophy. It's something that we practice and that our technologies and products are practicing. Thank you very much for listening.